Oh man, I love to hear you folks fellowshipping and spending time together, but we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. If you would stand with me as we honor God's Word, we begin with a reading from the Psalms this morning. This is Psalm chapter 81. It says this, Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Raise a song. Sound the tambourine, the sweet lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, a rule of the God of Jacob. He made it a decree in Joseph when he went out over the land of Egypt. I hear a language I had not known. I relieved your shoulder of the burden. Your hands were freed from the basket. In distress you called and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, while I admonish you, O Israel, if you would but listen to me, there shall be no strange God among you. You shall not bow down to a foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. But he would feed you with the finest of the wheat and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we set aside each week uh, to remember and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we have been free from sin and death, and we are no longer slaves. God, I pray that today, though, as many of us, as we walk through life, many of us are like the people of Israel. We've turned to other gods, we've turned to other things in our life, and and we have allowed compromise to creep into our life. Lord, you plead with us, you beg with us, and you say, if you will return to me, I'll bless you. But God, as we're going to look at in a little while, sometimes your love has to take a tough kind of form where you, as your word says here, you allow us, you allow us to go in our own direction so that hopefully we'll see our greatest need is you. So today as we worship, God, I pray that we would, as the psalmist opened this chapter, that we would shout for joy to the God of our salvation. That we would sing with the musical instruments, that we would lift our voices in praise because you are the God who has rescued us and saved us. And you are the reason we're here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You be seated for just a moment and check out this video from Annie Armstrong. For almost a hundred years, in big cities with a hundred skyscrapers and tiny towns with one stoplight, on college campuses, and Native American reservations. And churches, too many to count. Hundreds of thousands of men and women and boys and girls have made hundreds of thousands of life-changing decisions. Almost none of them knew her name. And yet, she was there. Annie Armstrong lived more than 100 years ago. Only this one picture of her survives. History could have easily forgotten her, but Annie Armstrong is worth remembering. In the late 1800s, when most women had no voice, Annie was one of the first to speak up. First, for the urban poor in her hometown of Baltimore, and then for Southern Baptist missionaries around the world who desperately needed support. It was for these people that she helped start the National Women's Missionary Union. As its first executive leader, she gave women a platform in their local church and in ways that they'd never done before. These women helped focus Southern Baptist attention on the hurting and the lost and the missionaries trying to reach them. Annie wrote letters, 18,000 in just one year, and she traveled across America encouraging missionaries and inspiring churches to pray, to give, and to act. 
She worked long hours, paid her own expenses, and refused to accept a salary. And in the darkest days of the Depression, right before she died, an offering was named after her. Today, the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering helps missionaries in the U.S. and Canada start new churches and meet needs through Compassion Ministries. Over the years, Southern Baptists have given more than $1 billion to that offering, and 100% of it, every penny, has gone straight to the mission field. There's still work left to do. The need is bigger than ever, and that's why even though she lived more than a century ago, and even though only one picture of her survives, Annie Armstrong's influence lives on. Because today in North America, just as it's been from the beginning, anywhere a missionary is sent, every time a new church is born, anytime someone gives to her offering so that a lost person might be found, Annie is there. Right. Well, good morning, Taylor Road family. Uh, I am Clint Bryan. I'm the student pastor here at Taylor Road, and it, it is such a pleasure. We, we just came back last night. A, a team of uh, us came back from San Diego last night. We were on mission trip to City Life San Diego, which is one of the beneficiaries of the Annie Armstrong offering. City Life San Diego was planted five years ago uh, through the North American Mission Board. And uh, it's because we give to Annie Armstrong that they were able to plant that church there. And they grew. Uh, when, we, when we first met them four years ago, there were 10 of them meeting in a backyard to over 80 of them meeting in a, a school cafeteria right now, which in San Diego is a huge, huge accomplishment. And our team got to participate in an Easter egg hunt this last Sunday with them where they saw over 400 people come through there and all of that uh, is made possible because of the giving uh, through the Annie Armstrong offering and so our Annie Armstrong offering here at Taylor Road our in gathering will be on Easter Sunday April 21st you can pick up the envelopes out by our missions counter out there up front and uh, you can pray over that how, how God would lead you to give and then you can bring that on April 21st Easter Sunday and we'll have our in gathering on that day if you are a guest with us here at Taylor Road, we are so excited to have you. Uh, hopefully you guys received a warm handshake or a hug when you guys came in. Uh, the one thing that we would ask of you, please, uh, is inside your bulletin, there's a little tear-off. If you would give us some information about yourself, uh, that's all we ask. If you would uh, just fill that out and then take it to our guest desk on your way out. Uh, there will be a staff member there to meet you and give you a, a little present as you go. Um, if you would... Go ahead and stand to your feet. Meet somebody new this morning. Shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, and, and let them know that you love them. Love you, Abs. Well, good morning. We're going to follow in Seth's footsteps a little bit this week and do a simple worship, which is Noah and Abby up here. So I invite y'all to remain standing and um, sing these songs with us. Salve! 
I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him. God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pain. God gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless. shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so sure shall stay
How rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Oh, we thank you so much. Thank you all. And uh, kids, well, kids worship is now, so kids are, exp- are dismissed to go to kids worship. Thank and you. as our ushers come forward this morning, I want you to just join me in a time of prayer. You know, those words, I love that song. And uh, thank Luke and the students for, uh, for leading us this morning, Seth's out of town. And just the amount of courage it takes as a, as a teenager to get up here in front of all you folks is just amazing. So we thank them. But... As, as we now worship through our giving, I want to encourage you, just as Jerry, just to give us a moment to pray, and then if you'll lead us in a time of prayer, but as we give of our tithes and offerings this morning, this is, this is worship, and, and I love that song because you know, it says that if, if the ocean's waters were ink, and you could write of the love of God, we would drain the ocean, and that's, that's so wonderful for us, but you know what? There's so many people that have never heard the good news of Jesus. And I want you to understand that each week as we give, we don't just give to keep lights on in this building or to make us comfortable. We give a portion of every offering goes to the North American Mission Board, goes to the International Mission Board, goes to send people here from Taylor Road on mission trips to to help support local ministries in our schools and in our city. And so we give so that people can go. And that the world can hear. And so right there this morning, if you have an offering to give, just in just a moment, if you just bow your heads with me as we pray, and just dedicate this offering to the Lord. And say, God, you can do way more with what I've given. No matter the amount, you can multiply it for your kingdom. So right there where you are, just dedicate this offering to the Lord. And dedicate yourself to the Lord. And then after a moment, Jerry Kaiser will pray over our offerings. Heavenly Father, this morning we humble ourselves before you at the foot of the cross, Father. We just thank you for everything you do for us. We thank you so much for Jesus that on that cross he died for us in three days he rose again to give us salvation. Father, as we come to this time of our worship, like Daniel was talking, Father, uh, we show our love for you through our worship and our offerings, Father. We just ask that we would just give with a cheerful and unselfish heart, Father, that you would just multiply these offerings and send them or spread the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Father, we just ask that we would uh, open the eyes of our heart this morning, Lord, as uh, Daniel breaks the bread of life in front of us, Father, and that we we would just open our hearts for that blessing he's going to give us, Father, through His word, through the word of Jesus. Now we just ask, Father, that you just be with us and everything that we do and say would always honor and glorify your name. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
If you'll take your Bibles and go to the Old Testament Gospel of Hosea. If you are visiting with us this morning, welcome, and you may be going, what on earth is going on here? But we are in a six-part series right now through the Old Testament Gospel of Hosea and the story that God was telling his people of their infidelity against him, their adultery against him as they've followed other gods, they've broken covenant relationship with God. And so what we're doing over the next few weeks leading up to Easter is we are looking at six aspects of God's love, six different aspects of God's love. And there's three layers to this story, really. It's the story of Hosea and his wife, Gomer. If you were here last week or you're familiar with the story, I don't want to assume that everybody knows the story of Hosea, but Hosea was the Old Testament prophet. God told him, go marry a prostitute. Hosea's jaw probably hit the floor. God said, I want you to be a living illustration, a sermon illustration to my people to show them what they are doing to me, how they are committing adultery and cheating on me. Because God had entered into what he viewed as a marriage relationship with Israel at Mount Sinai. We're really beginning with Abraham and then culminating at Mount Sinai with the law. And his command to them was, you love me, you obey me, you keep no other gods before me, you worship me alone, and I will bless you, and I will multiply, and I will protect you. But the moment you begin to run out on me, I'm going to remove my hand of blessing. And so God is wanting Israel to see a very vivid description of what they are doing to him. So the first layer of that story is Hosea and Gomer, his wife. Don't ask me why her name was Gomer. Uh, Your guess is as good as mine. But then the next layer is God's relationship with Israel. But ultimately what we see is God's relationship with us. God's relationship with us. And so as we unpack this book of Hosea, we see, we're going to see, again, six different aspects of God's love. And I I kind of view it as as a diamond. You know, you kind of hold it up to the light and you see the different angles, the different cuts. And it's all beautiful from every angle in every direction. And so kind of view God's love as a diamond that we're going to hold up and we're going to look at different angles and different cuts. And if you were with us last week, you saw that we looked at the covenant love of God, that God's love is unchanging, that God's love is unfailing, that he is faithful to his covenant promises, even when we are faithless, that God is faithful, even when we are faithless. And this morning, We're going to talk about an aspect of God's love that maybe makes us uncomfortable, that honestly, when we're going through it as a child of God, we don't really like it because it's not enjoyable. This is not really fun, but it is love. It's God's love. And it's another aspect, another angle of God's love, and it's his tough love. And so this morning, if you're saved, if you're a child of God this morning, uh, my, my goal, my end goal, what I've been praying towards is that we leave this place just really in awe of God's love and, 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 and loving God's tough love, even though we may not like it in the moment. And there may be someone here this morning as a child of God, God is wrestling with you. Maybe there's some uh, uh, sin in your life that you've allowed to go unconfessed, unrepented of. And I, I hope by the end of this message today that you see the, the last scene of that video was the wedding ring. I'm going to just go ahead and give you the ending right here. The wedding ring never gets put up with God. The wedding ring never gets put away with God. And even though his tough love is not very fun in our lives, God never stops loving his children, never stops pursuing his children. And so this morning... As we get into Hosea chapter 2, I want you, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because this is really the overarching truth of of what we see in Hosea chapter 2. And it's this, very simple. God's love goes the distance. God's love will go the distance. His love for you will never stop. In fact, God's love has gone the ultimate distance by sending his son to the cross. God's love goes the distance, and it doesn't just stop the moment you get saved. When we are saved and we are children of God, even when we run from him, his love goes the distance. 
And so here in Hosea chapter 2, we're going to kind of break this down. So let's look in Hosea chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We're going to read the first few verses, and we'll stop and talk about it for a few minutes. But listen to what the Word of God says through Hosea. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters, you have received mercy. Plead with your mother. Plead. For she is not my wife, or in the Hebrew it literally means she is not acting like my wife. In her eyes, she is not living in covenant relationship with me. She is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Plead with her that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born, and make her like a wilderness, and make her like a parched land, and kill her with thirst." Upon her children also I will have no mercy, because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. So let's stop there for a moment. Again, revisiting last week, Hosea knew going into this, He knew that she would be unfaithful to him. He knew before he even popped the question and even approached her to marry him, he knew she was going to be unfaithful to him. And let me just tell you this, God, before he saved you, knew that you would continue to struggle with sin. But he loves you enough to transform you and change you and to chase you down. God's love goes the distance His love goes the distance. Here at the beginning of this text, in the first five verses, Hosea, as you see beginning in verse 1, he is imploring his children. He is imploring his children to plead with their mother. In other words, what Hosea is saying is, she won't listen to me. She won't answer the phone, if there were phones back then. She won't return any texts. She won't won't, get back in touch with me. She's not listening to me. In fact, she's not even, as you look there in verse 2, she's not acting like we're married. She's gone off to be with these other men. And he's pleading with his children. If she won't listen to me, surely she'll listen to you. Surely she she will listen to her children. I don't know where she is. Tell her I love her. She's not acting like my wife. In fact, look again at verse 5. She has acted shamefully. She's acted shamefully. She's brought shame and reproach, Hosea says, to me and the, and the family. She's, in fact, she's had three kids with three different guys. She's had three kids. She has not been faithful in our marriage. And this is a picture of what Israel was doing to God. They were acting shamefully because of their sin. They had pursued the God of Baal. They had, they had worshipped. They had allowed. It began with compromise when, when they allowed other people groups to live among them. And those people groups brought their gods and their, their false religions in with them. And we saw last week, whatever you worship, you ultimately serve. Whatever you worship, whatever you submit your life to, Whatever it is, whether it's work, whether it's sports, whether it's relationships, whatever it is, money, success, whatever you make the highest priority in your life, you will ultimately serve. And it will begin to flesh itself out in your life. And so these weren't harmless little statues in their midst. These weren't harmless little dolls in their house that they looked at or they may have bowed down to. No, Baal worship led to even further atrocious acts. They were committing prostitution. They were committing uh, child sacrifice. In fact, God, one of his biggest issues with Israel in all of this, is said, he said, you are my chosen people. You are the people that I redeemed. You are the people that I brought out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea into the wilderness and into the promised land. You're the people that I've provided for. You're the people that I've rescued and redeemed and restored. And you are making a mockery of my name before the nations. Can I just say this as a, just a moment of stepping aside and maybe getting on a soapbox for a second? The church of God in America has made a mockery of his name. 
because we have bowed to the God of culture. We have bowed to the God of culture. Last night, Christy and I went to, I was sharing this with the Young Professionals group, Christy and I went to a concert last night. And unfortunately, vulgar language was used at that concert. There were 12,000 people there. And all at one time, not us, I promise, and I'm sure not with everybody, that crowd began to shout vulgarities. And I sat up at the top of the BJCC in Birmingham. And I thought to myself, you know, I doubt that Christy and I are the only Christ followers in this place. But how sad is it that people all over this arena are being swept away with the current of culture? Maybe not even thinking twice about what they're saying. Just yelling it because everybody around them is yelling it and they're caught up in the moment. And I sat up there at the very top of that arena because I I got the cheap seats. We were sitting up at the very top. And I thought, this is such a picture of American Christianity. This is such a picture of American Christianity that we come in here all prettied up on Sunday morning, but Monday through Saturday we go out and you can't tell the church from the rest of the world. We look like the world, we sound like the world, we talk like the world, we dress like the world, we do all of these things, and God says, you are making a mockery of my name before the nations. God saved Israel for his glory, and all through the Old Testament, God says, I saved you to point other people to me. I saved you. So listen to me. God has saved you. He sent his son to shed his blood on a cross for you and me, not just so that you and I can walk down an aisle, sign a card, get wet in a baptistry, and go to heaven when we die, but so that we can be the representatives of his glory on this earth. So that when the world looks at us, they see Jesus. Listen, we're not going to be perfect, but they see a people who have been redeemed and transformed. In fact, this was what God said to Israel in the book of Isaiah in verse 5 of chapter 52. Now, therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing, their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. My name is despised. I heard a story one time about Alexander the Great. And a young soldier was brought to him one day, a young man who had joined or was in the army, was in, uh, serving under Alexander the Great and his forces. And this young man had turned tail. He had turned into a coward and he had run from battle. And he had been captured. And he was brought before Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great said to him, young man, what is your name? And this young man said, Alexander, sir. And Alexander the Great looked at him and said, either change your name or change your ways. Change your name or change your ways. Can I I tell you why the church in America has lost effectivity? It's because the world can't tell the difference. The world can't tell the difference. I'm not talking about going out and protesting and picketing and all that. I'm talking very simply Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Can the world tell a difference? God's issue with Israel was that his name was being profaned because of the way they were living, because of their rebellion and their disobedience. In this text, Hosea According to Jewish law, Hosea had every right in the world to divorce his wife. Hosea, under the Mosaic law, had every right in the world to divorce her. He had every right in the world to even to put her to death. He had every right in the world to have her stoned publicly. What did she really deserve? She really deserved that. Her sin found her guilty. She deserved condemnation. What did Israel literally deserve? They deserved to be wiped off the map. God literally could have been justified. He's justified in anything he does. But he would have been completely justified by crushing them, annihilating them, and starting all over. Here's the question. What do you and I deserve for our sin? We are sinners 
living in the presence of a holy God. Can I tell you something? The fact that you're sitting in this seat this morning and the fact that your heart just beat and you took a breath is a sign of the love and mercy of God. Because we should be consumed by the wrath of God for our sin. But the gospel is that his son was consumed for us in our place. Israel deserved this. They deserved God's wrath. Gomer deserved judgment. We deserve judgment. But God, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, God is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. You know what that word mercy means? Mercy means us not getting what we deserve. That God is rich. He's not just merciful. I love what Paul says. He is rich in mercy. His bank account of mercy never runs out. The psalmist says that his mercies are new every morning. Can I just say, praise God, because I used enough mercy yesterday. I need a fresh start today. I'm guilty of enough sin of yesterday knowing that God's God's mercy is plentiful for today. He is rich in mercy. But for the child of God, for the saved and redeemed, he will sometimes exercise tough love. Not wrath, not condemnation, but as our Father who is in heaven, he will sometimes exercise his love in a tough way. It's tough because it's not fun. It's tough because it hurts, but it's love because it's purposeful. It's love because it's purposeful. So if you're taking notes, write this down. The purpose of God's tough love in the life of his child is always redemptive. The purpose of God's tough love in the life of his child is always redemptive. This is why I love the Apostle Paul. You know, we're funny as Christians. We read the Bible weird. As if Paul sat down and said, chapter one, and then he began writing. Chapter two, chapter three, like a book. You know. And we love, as Christians, we love to run to Romans chapter seven. And, and we love to beat ourselves up over that text. He's, you know, where Paul says, the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I know I should do, I don't do. And there's this battle inside me and it's waging. And, and, and he says, I'm just this wretched sinner because I know that I should be obedient to God. But then I find myself not being obedient to God. And then I know that I, I shouldn't do these things, but I wind up doing them. And Paul's just beating himself up and beating himself up. And many of us say, I identify with that. That's me. That's me. That's me. How many of you have ever read that passage and go, nailed it right here. But we don't, we don't go to the next chapter. What are the very next words? But there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God convicts us of our sin, but he never, for his children, he never condemns us for our sin. If you are saved this morning, you can rest assured of the promise that God will convict you of sin. And he will do that through tough love, but you will never be condemned. Why? Because that was the ultimate condemnation. Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. It's always redemptive. God's tough love is always redemptive. You see, there's two reasons why God hates sin First of all, it is an affront to his glory. It is rebellion against his glory and authority and lordship. But secondly, God hates sin because it destroys the fellowship that we have with him. He is holy. He will not allow sin into his presence. And when we begin to live in habitual, unrepentant sin, it begins to hurt that fellowship that we have. Begins to hurt that fellowship that we have. And God will not let sin go unpunished. Again, I'm not talking about his wrathful condemnation and judgment on his children. I'm talking about the tough love of discipline. You discipline your own children. It's not because you hate them or you want to make their life miserable. It's because you love them. I can remember that as a kid, y'all. How many of you got spankings? Anybody get spankings? I'm okay admitting this. 
I spanked my children in public one day. A woman looked at me. I said, please take me. <laughs> Call them. I, <laughs> anywhere is more peaceful than where we are right now. <laughs> I can remember my daddy, though, saying, I'm doing this because I love you. And I remember going, you are crazy. You're spanking me because you love me? I get it now. I get it now. Because why? Why do we discipline our children out of love? Because we see the destructive path that lies ahead. If we don't correct the little things, it's going to lead to bigger things, isn't it? And we do it out of love. And God is the exact same way. I have learned so much. I'm not a perfect father. My wife is here and she will attest to you. Don't ask my children, but my wife will tell you, I'm not a perfect father, but I have a perfect father. Amen. And his name is God. And I learned so much about my relationship with my children from my relationship with him. And God is tough in his love with us sometimes. And so let me just say this to you at this point. If you are here this morning and you are a child of God and you're saved, but you're living in sin, let me just give you this word of encouragement. God has not given up on you. God has not abandoned you. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's the proof of his love. It's the proof of his love. Watch how this unfolds. Look again at verse 5. Plead with your mother, for, for she has played the whore. She has, who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. But look what he says. Look what he says. I, I will hedge up her way with thorns. We're going to talk about that in a second. I will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers but not overtake them and she shall seek them but she will not find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain and the wine and the oil and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its season. And I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will go and uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to her mirth and her feasts and her new moons and her Sabbaths and all her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste to her vines and her fig trees of which she said, these are my wages which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest and the beast of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the days of the bales when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares the Lord. This is no longer Hosea talking. This is Yahweh speaking. Speaking to his people, Israel. I want you to look in this passage at how God deals with sin. How his tough love deals with sin. First of all, he deals with it, I think, passively. I think there's a passiveness to the tough love of God. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 5, the second part of that. She says, I'm going to go after my lovers. Forget you, Hosea. Forget your rules. Forget your relationship. I'm going to go after my lovers, and they're the ones who give me bread and water and wool and flax and oil and drink. Let me just say this. Sin is always enjoyable in the moment. I guarantee you, whatever fruit that was, Adam and Eve ate in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't crawling with worms and rotting. It was probably the most delicious looking, I think it was a papaya, papaya you've ever had in your life. No theological reason, it's just fun to say. But it's the most beautiful fruit. In fact, what does the Bible say about Satan? He disguises himself as what? An angel of what? Light. Sin is always enjoyable in the moment. The pleasures of sin, though, have a very short lifespan. In the book of Hebrews, the writer calls the pleasures of sin fleeting. My dad used to tell me five minutes of pleasure can cause a lifetime of pain. I guarantee you, those of you who have had the opportunity to go with us to do prison ministry, there's five minutes in each of those men's lives they wish they could take back. 
And it's not, that's an extreme example. But I guarantee you every one of us in here could say, there's five minutes of my life I wish I could take back. Five minutes of pleasure will lead to a lifetime of pain. And I think as Christians, we're tempted to believe that God's discipline in our lives sometimes looks like you know, our car breaking down or our refrigerator tearing up. No, no, no. I think it's worse than that. I think it's worse than that. I think that the worst kind of discipline God can show us is to let us have what we think we want. She says right here in verse 5, I'm going to go after my other lovers. I'm going to get the food they give me. They lavish all these things on me. Notice what Hosea doesn't do. Hosea doesn't rush in and go, no, you're not. I won't let you go. What does he do? Go ahead. Go ahead. The discipline of God, the tough love of God, I think many times takes the form of God allowing us to have what we think we want. Verse 5, she says, they provide all these things. Can you imagine how hard it must have been for Hosea to watch his wife walk out the door, knowing what she was going to do? How hard must it be? How tough must it be on our father to watch us chase the fleeting pleasures of sin in our own life, knowing the destruction it's causing in our own lives and to our relationship with him? In fact, this is the verse we read earlier in Psalm 81. God says, so I gave them over to their stubborn hearts. I gave them over to follow their own counsels. So I think sometimes God's tough love is shown passively. He says, okay, have your own way. Have your own way. You know, we've talked about this before. But if we confess our sins, what does the Bible say? He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us. But you know what? He doesn't always take away the consequences of our sin. He doesn't always take away the consequences, the earthly consequences of our sin. He does it passively, but I think the tough love of God is also shown in an active way, in an active way. Look at your text again there in verse 6. I will hedge up her way with thorns. I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. I think what we see here in Hosea's relationship with Gomer is what we can call the principle of the thorns. The principle of the thorns. Sometimes, as we saw in the video earlier, sometimes you've got to cut off the resources. Sometimes you've got to cut up the credit cards, cut off the phone, cut the support. Look, I mean, Hosea says right here, she will come back to me. Verse 7, I will go and return to my first husband because I realized it was him. It was he who provided everything that I needed, everything that I desired. And sometimes God will put a hedge of thorns around you in a loving way, and it may hurt in the moment to allow you to hit rock bottom so that you see Jesus is all my heart desires. He is all I need. I've been chasing the fleeting pleasures of sin, finding momentary happiness in other things, but Jesus alone can bring joy you see, I believe that it's without, without getting into a, a false gospel, but I do believe the Bible does teach that, that God will remove his hand of blessing if we are living in unrepentant, unconfessed sin. You see, Israel was crediting Baal with all of their gospel, I mean, all their blessings. They were saying, Baal's the one who gives us these things. Baal's the one who provides for these things. And God said here in the text, I will allow their vineyards to shrivel I will remove my hand of blessing. I don't know about you, but I want God's blessing in my life. I want his blessing in my marriage. I want his blessing in my relationships. But sometimes God will remove that hand of blessing if we are stubborn. If we are stubborn. You see... You may be here this morning, you may feel the hedge of thorns around you. Can I give you some pastorly, brotherly advice? Stop running. Stop running. Surrender. Surrender to Jesus. Listen, your situation is not a sign that God has rejected you. God's not rejected you, it's proof that he loves you. We see this played out so beautifully, I think, in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus says this. 
there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. My inheritance. Culturally, what he was saying to his father was, I wish you were dead. I hate you. So just give me the money. And he divided the property between the sons. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, and I love what some translations say, when he came to his senses, this young man said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. How many of I don't want you to raise your hand, but maybe you're under the weight of guilt and shame. I'm not even, I don't even deserve to be called a son. Sin has taken you into a far country led you further than you ever wanted to go, kept you longer than you ever wanted to stay, and caused you to pay more than you ever intended to pay. And now I'm, I'm, he, I'm here trying this church thing out. My tail stuck between my legs. I don't, I don't even know if I'm worthy to be called God's child. So he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And I love the last words. And they began to celebrate. They partied. You see, the beauty of the tough love of God is that he's willing to engage you. He's willing to wrestle with you. He's not willing to give up on you. He's willing to do whatever it takes. God's love is tough sometimes in that it hurts because it's not pleasant and he allows us to run into a hedge of thorns. But can I tell you something? It's love in that like Hosea, the door to the house is kept open. You know where to find the key. The house is not locked. The wedding ring is never put away. Just like the father with the prodigal son, you've gone off to a far country. You've squandered your wealth. You've made a mockery of the family name. You've lived in sin that is unimaginable and we don't even think about. But can I tell you something? What's beautiful about this is that the father had kept a calf fattened for just this occasion. The, the calf has been kept fattened. And there's a party waiting on you. He's standing in the road waiting. Not to condemn you, but to restore you, to forgive you. And to say, let's party. Now you can enjoy my provision in your life. Would you bow your heads with me as Luke comes and leads us in a song of response? And maybe you're here this morning and you would say, first of all, Daniel, I, I don't even have a relationship with God. Can I lovingly tell you? lovingly tell you that God will 
punish sin. And you can either receive the free gift of salvation, Jesus under the wrath of God in your place, or you can continue to reject him and spend eternity separated from God in hell, experiencing his wrath for all of eternity. God's free gift of salvation. No hoops, no strings attached. It's grace. Maybe you're here and you say, Daniel, I need to receive that free gift of salvation. Can I tell you something? God has pursued you all the way to the cross. He loves you enough that he sent his son to die for you and to rise again from the dead. And if you're here this morning and you say, Daniel, I need to put my faith and trust in Jesus and receive his free gift of salvation, just right where you are with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just say, God, I admit to you I'm a sinner. And I know that I deserve to be punished for my sin. But God, I believe that you sent your son to take my punishment on the cross. The sin that I've committed. The sin that he is innocent of. He took it on himself. And God, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. Please come into my life and save me. I want to follow you. I surrender my life to you as my Lord and my King. Now with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you this morning, if you prayed that prayer, we're not going to embarrass you or anything like that. I just want to ask you just to slip up your hand. Say, Daniel, I prayed to receive Christ this morning, and I, need, I, I just want you to pray for me. You said, today I've been born again. Now for the children of God, those who have been saved, maybe you've been running. Maybe you've been running and you need to submit your life to Jesus' lordship again. Maybe you need to come to this altar and get some things right with God. You say, I know I've been living in the tough love of God. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of running. I need to come back in the right relationship with him. This altar area is open. Maybe you've been through our new members class and you say, today I officially want to make it public and join this church family. I'll be right here to pray with you, talk to you about any decision you have this morning. Father, all over this room, I pray that we would be submissive to your Holy Spirit. And however he's leading us, I pray that we'd be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? What's your next step? What's your next step? That's our theme this year. Will you follow Jesus? Will you lay some things down at the altar? What next step is God calling you to as we sing this morning? Pain of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betray. The sin of men in wrath of God has been on Jesus' slain. Silence of heaven God's own son to purchase and redeem and reconcile the Hallelujah, praise Him.
Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. And now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Soon the sun sets free. saved us, and you're the one who continues to pursue us relentlessly. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would be a people, a people that represent Jesus this week in our life, in our words, in our conversations. God, Lord, give us opportunities to share Jesus with people. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And if you would remain standing, I just want to point out a couple of things. First of all, and I don't know where it went, there's... We had one name move to the green uh, last week, and so that means that one of our folks has led uh, a family member or friend to Christ, and our board here is, we got paper down here, so at the end of the service this morning, if you have somebody that you know that doesn't know Jesus and God's laid on your heart, just come take a piece of paper, hang it on there, uh, and we'll just be praying over that. Uh, I want to present a couple to you here this morning, so y'all come on up here. This is Keith and Linda Richardson, and they went through our new members class, and uh, which we will begin a new round of those for three weeks next Sunday morning. So if you're interested in joining Taylor Road and, and going through the new members class, contact the church office. But Keith and Linda Richardson were uh, in our, our last new members class, and we just had a blast getting to know them. But they feel like this is where God wants them to call home now. And so we, uh, we rejoice in that. And so, Jerry, if you'll take them out to the foyer, uh, and, uh, and folks will come and, and love on you guys and pray over you. Uh, I want to ask Bonnie and Mike Eves to come up here. And we, we do this uh, whenever we're made aware of situations that we can be praying over. But uh, do you mind if I share? Okay. Bonnie will be going to Houston tomorrow for some scans. Many of you know she's battled cancer for a long time now. And so uh, we do believe in, as a family, this is what this is, as a family that we pray for one another, we bear one another's burdens. So I want to ask, if you're just down in this area and you'd like to come and just pray over them, we want to close our service with praying over Mike and Bonnie. And you can see your bulletin for all of the announcements. Uh, this is, kind of takes precedence over uh, spending time doing announcements. But look at your bulletin for all the announcements, uh, and, um, and uh, we'll see you Wednesday night. But let's pray over Mike and Bonnie. And then at, at the conclusion of the service, I want to ask all of our uh, deacons, uh, to meet me uh, in, the, uh, in the prayer room. So if you're a deacon, just meet me in the prayer room with the eaves. We just want to have a special time of prayer with our, our church deacons over them before they go tomorrow to Houston. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you are the God of miracles. We thank you that you are the God who is omniscient. You know all things from beginning to end. God, nothing escapes your sight. Nothing escapes your power. Nothing escapes your sovereignty. And so, Father, we know that you, you know uh, already what Bonnie and Mike are going to find out in the next few days. So, God, nothing will move you off of your throne. And so, God, as your throne in heaven is the, the unshakable place in the universe, I pray that Bonnie and Mike would find their rest there. Lord, that you would, uh, your will would be done in their lives. Lord, knowing this family that they are going to use every opportunity to make Jesus known in the good and in the bad. So, Lord, whatever the outcome is, Lord, uh, I pray that their focus would be set on Jesus. Lord, that, that they would rest in you. Lord, we do. We pray for miracles. God, we pray for healing. We pray for just uh, the doctors to say we can't explain it. Lord, we would love nothing more than their sentence to start with that. 
And so God, as a, as a church family, we, we love them and we support them. And we, we, we just want to be like those, those men who held Moses' arms up when he got tired. Lord, that's what you've called us to. And so God, we just pray over them. We pray your healing over them. And we love you and we, we commit their, their lives and our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As you're going back to your seats, loving on them, Luke's going to lead us with a song and you are dismissed. Again, deacons, if you'll meet me in the, uh, in the prayer room in a few minutes. See the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb.